Hi everyone, this is lesson 1.11, Psychometric Methods of Analysis. This is adapted from the PSHS Chemistry 4 module lesson 1.11. For our targets, first, apply the concepts of psychometric analysis to a wide variety of problems in analysis. Second, choose the appropriate classical method of analysis needed for specific problems. So in the previous module, we have learned about gravimetry. It's a technique where the mass of a sample and a pure compound is related to the concentration of the analyte. On the other hand, titrometry is a technique where the volume of the sample and standard reagent is used as basis for calculating the concentration of the analyte. So for gravimetry, we are concerned with obtaining the mass of the sample. On the other hand, for titrometry, we are concerned with obtaining the volume of the sample and the standard reagent in order to calculate for the concentration or amount of the analyte. Also, the module suggests that we watch this video. So I have provided you the link already. So we will not, we will skip this part and proceed with the rest of the module. So after watching the video, you should be able to accomplish the following. First, to write a flow chart showing the steps involved in the titration process and second, to draw and label the titration setup. So here's an illustration of the titration setup. Of course, the most important part is the burette containing our standard solutions, as well as the analyte being contained usually by an Erlenmeyer flask and the clamp and stand that supports them. So titration is a process which uses the burette that delivers the titrant to react with the analyte, usually in an Erlenmeyer flask. So at the end of the reaction, there's a physical change, usually a change in color of the analyte solution. And the total volume of the titrant dispensed is used to calculate the concentration of the analyte. So here's an illustration showing that, again, first, we dispense our analyte solution into an Erlenmeyer flask, and then we add a chemical indicator so that when we add standard solution coming from a burette, of course, first we measure the initial reading or volume reading from the burette, and uh, dispensing this uh, standard solution onto the analyte would eventually lead us to a color change, which we call the endpoint, which also marks the end of the titration process. So notice that from a colorless solution, the endpoint has been marked by a color change from colorless to pink. So we would assume that this reaction shown is most likely an acid base or a neutralization titration using phenolphthalein as indicator. So here are some terms used in volumetric analysis. First, standard solution. It's a solution of known concentration used to react with the analyte or sample in titration. These solutions should be stable they should be able to react rapidly, like immediately after dispensing it from the burette, they should be able to react immediately, completely. Meaning that for as long as they are mixed with the analyte, they should react completely and selectively with the analyte solution. Selective means that it should not simply react with everything and anything that's also in the sample solution. So as much as possible, it should only choose to react with the analyte or the substance of interest. 
So from this illustration, the standard solution, as mentioned, would be found here inside the burette. And it is being dispensed into the analyte solution. Next, back titration is a titration technique where the analyte is first reacted with excess amount of a first titrant to ensure completeness of reaction. And then the excess of the first titrant is neutralized by careful addition of a second titrant into the mixture. Then the volumes of all solutions used in the whole process are accounted for. So I just made a few edits from this previous illustration to show the difference between a normal titration process and the back titration process. So from this illustration, this is a normal titration process. You have the analyte, then you dispense a standard solution, and you reach the end point. On the other hand, if you do back titration, that would mean that after preparing the analyte solution, we would be adding a first titrant. In this case, the first titrant would be base, but dispensed in excess so that we now kind of over, have overrun the endpoint. And then the second titrant, this time an acid will be used to titrate the excess base that we have added in the system to return it back into a colorless solution. So that is the final endpoint a pink color to a colorless solution. Why is back titration done? Usually, as mentioned here, um, we would want that the reaction between the analyte and the first titrant is complete. That's why it has been provided in excess. And then in the back titration part, the species that we are already titrating isn't the analyte anymore, but the excess base. This is also done when it is not practical to titrate the analyte itself. That is why we can let it react with the first titrant, and the first titrant, which is more convenient to titrate, is the one being titrated by the second standard solution or the second titrant. So here are more terms. Equivalence point. This refers to the point in a titration where the concentration of the titrant completely reacts with the analyte species. So this happens when the titrant that has been dispensed is chemically equivalent to the analyte present in the sample. Now, this is something that we cannot see. And to help us visualize this, because we do not have sub-microscopic um, vision, so we employ the services or the, the powers of a chemical indicator. Now, the chemical indicator is a chemical species added to the analyte to aid in signaling the endpoint of the titration. And that visual signal is now called there the endpoint. It's a physical manifestation, such as a color change, formation of a precipitate that signals the that the system reached the equivalence point. In this case, for an acid-based titration and using a phenolphthalein indicator, so we would expect that the end point would be a color change from colorless to pink. So here's an illustration of a good end point and here's a bad end point. The pink color in this case is too intense showing that the pH of the solution is already very high. The, at equivalence point, we are expecting that the pH is seven. And 
phenolphthalein changes color at around 8 to 10. Therefore, we would like to see the faintest pink possible instead of this very intense pink, which shows that we have already added titrant to an excess. So to show you more examples of endpoints, here is one which shows uh, an endpoint from the appearance of a brick red precipitate. So in this titration process, this is not acid-based titration anymore. So we have a pale yellow solution after adding standard solution, a, a white precipitate has formed. And upon an, an excess addition of titrant, a brick red precipitate has formed. And that signals the end of the titration or the end point. Another example would be this, where we start off with a high concentration of iodine in the solution. And then after addition of titan, it has become less intense. So thus the pale ye straw yellow color. Now, because we are now nearing the equivalence point, then we are at, we, at this point, we would be adding starch indicator. Now the starch indicator binds with the iodine in solution and forms this dark blue, almost black solution, which after uh, an appropriate amount of standard solution has been added, turns colorless. So the final endpoint for this titration process would be a color change from dark blue to colorless. Okay, so for the specific details of these, of these titration processes, um, they will be discussed most likely in some of the applications of titrometric analysis that we will be discussing in the future. So next, standardization is the procedure where a primary standard is used to react with a secondary standard solution to determine its concentration. Now, in simple terms, what is standardization? This is simply verifying the concentration of the standard solution that we use for titration. For example, in your grade 10, you have most probably experienced an acid-based titration where you have acid as the analyte and a sodium hydroxide base as the standard solution. Now the sodium hydroxide solution, which was considered a standard solution already, was prepared from sodium hydroxide, maybe pellets or flakes. And that preparation is probably not too accurate or in the first place, the sodium hydroxide pellets used were probably not of high purity. So in order for us to determine that the standard solution that we're using has a specific concentration, then we would have to let it react with a different chemical of higher purity, which is called the primary standard. In this case, if uh, we are using sodium hydroxide as the secondary standard, then the primary standard is usually KHP or potassium hydrogen phthalate. Potassium hydrogen phthalate is um, a white crystalline solid and it's usually provided in very high purities Therefore, its concentration when prepared in solution is very reliable. So 
we use the primary standard and titrate it with the secondary standard and do the calculations so that from the concentration of the primary standard, we can calculate for the concentration of the secondary standard. And then this secondary standard is the one which we use for analyzing a lot of other analytes there. Okay, so again, standardization is a process of determining the concentration of a secondary standard. And that secondary standard is usually the one we use to titrate all other analytes for practical purposes. So I have already discussed the primary and secondary standards from this illustration. So their definitions are that the primary standard or chemical species of high purity and of known concentration that is used to determine the concentration of a secondary standard. It may also be used in other quantitative analysis. The secondary standard is a chemical species whose concentration is determined by standardization against a primary standard. It serves as the working solution in conducting titrations and in other analytical work. Now, you may wonder why it's not straightforward. Like, why not just use a primary standard to immediately titrate and analyze? The reason is primary standards, because of their high purity, are usually very expensive. So it's more practical to actually prepare a secondary standard solution in bulk, which you will only standardize once or a few times and use the secondary standard to titrate a, um, a number or a significantly higher number of analyte samples. Okay, so here are properties of primary standards. This is an illustration of potassium hydrogen phthalate, the one that I mentioned to you earlier. It's used as the primary standard for sodium hydroxide and acid base titrations. So they should have high purity. So notice that this container is just really small. So you do not really use primary standards in bulk or in high amounts. They should be stable and unreactive to atmospheric constituents, meaning they should not absorb water fast from the environment. So comparing potassium hydrogen phthalate with sodium hydroxide, if you have ever handled or weighed sodium hydroxide pellets in the lab, you'll find that in just a few minutes of exposure to the atmosphere, they're already kind of watery. Third, primary standards should not contain hydrate water. They should have a reasonable cost and good solubility in the solvent used in titration, mostly just water, and it should have a large molar mass to minimize relative error. So why do they need to have a large molar mass? That's because these are prepared uh, from their solid state. So you'd have to weigh them accurately and then prepare a solution out of it carefully, uh, ever so carefully, so that you do not lose any of the crystals or in order to minimize error. So a larger molar mass would be very advantageous so that given the mass of the solid, it would only co inside or it would only correspond to a smaller number of moles of particles. Okay, so this time we will be proceeding with volumetric calculations. So for the first set of calculations, 
we will be okay, we will be solving how uh, calculating the molar concentration of standard solutions. So first, describe the preparation of two liters of 0 0.05 molar sulfur nitrate from the primary standard grade solid. So it's a simple process, simple problem. You just have this is just a this is just a solution preparation problem. So how do we prepare two liters of 0 0.05 molar silver nitrate from the primary standard grade solid? Simply compute for the mass of silver nitrate required to produce that concentration of two liters solution. So we start with two liters multiplied with the desired concentration of silver nitrate to get moles silver nitrate and then convert moles silver nitrate into gram silver nitrate and report the final answer to three supposedly three significant figures okay so that's Three significant figures, however, the question simply asks us to describe the preparation. So if we're going to you to prepare a standard solution from a primary standard grade solid, then expect that we will be using an analytical balance that can measure up to four decimal places of a gram. Okay, the cabinet type analytical balance therefore if we can be as accurate as we can then it would be best to um yon, to be as accurate as possible and to answer the question here's the final answer a 0 0.05 molar solution of silver nitrate is prepared by dissolving 16.987 grams of solid silver nitrate in distilled water and diluted to two liters in a volumetric flask. So notice that we did not add two liters of water. Rather, first we obtain the solid and then it is diluted to mark. So did we add two liters of water? No, we have added, we have actually added less than two liters of water because the 16.987 grams of solid silver nitrate has, is already occupying some space on its own or some volume on its own. So there's the final answer. Number two, a standard 0 0.01 molar solution of sodium ion is required to calibrate an ion selective electrode method to determine sodium. Describe how 500 ml of this solution can be prepared from primary standard sodium carbonate. Okay, so there might be a lot of things you're not familiar with. However, if we can just distill this problem, it simply means, it simply asks, us to describe how 500 ml of a standard 0 0.01 molar solution of sodium ion can be prepared from sodium carbonate primary standard. So here's the solution. First we start with 500 ml of the solution and then convert it into millimoles of sodium ion because we would like to have 500 ml of this concentration of sodium ion. So multiplying them, we would be able to get millimoles of sodium ion and then convert the millimoles sodium ion into millimoles of sodium carbonate and from there convert the millimoles of sodium carbonate into mass of sodium carbonate using the molar mass. So notice that because we have started with 500 ml, so everything else is in milli. So because we've started with ml, the concentration units that we use is millimole per ml. 
millimole over millimole, milligram per millimole. The molar mass has been expressed as milligrams per millimole instead of grams per mole. And then finally, the answer is reported as 264.975 milligrams. So this is fine if you're comfortable with using milligrams as the final unit for mass. Anyway, the problem did not specify which mass unit to use. You may also be more comfortable with converting the 500 ml solution initially into liters so that your final answer would be expressed in grams. So, to answer the question, the solution can be prepared by dissolving 0.265 grams sodium carbonate in distilled water and diluting to 500 ml in a volumetric flask. So notice that in the final answer, all the extra digits has been, have been dropped and the mass has been reported in grams. That's because, again, for practical purposes, when we're using the cabinet type analytical balance, so which is able to report mass up to four decimal places of a gram, so this number would suffice. This would be the most accurate that we can manage in preparing the desired concentration of the desired with the desired volume. So again, let me emphasize that when we prepare a solution, you start with the mass of the solute, which we dissolve in a little bit of water, and then we dilute to mark using inside a volumetric flask. Next, still on the preparation of standard solutions. So how would you prepare 50 ml portions? of standard solutions that are 0 0.005 molar, 0 0.002 molar, and 0 0.001 molar in sodium ion from the solution in example two. So notice that we are asked to produce this time decreasing concentrations of the sodium ion solution from example two. So this is example two and then we have 0 0.01 molar of solution with a volume of 500 ml. So as you solve this problem, I hope you can also visualize that after number two, we already have a 500 ml volumetric flask containing 0 0.01 molar solution of sodium ion. Now, how do we prepare 50 ml portions of standard solutions with the corresponding decreasing concentrations? So we use the dilution formula. This, um, which I fondly say just M1V1 equals M2V2. So we would like to know the volume of the concentrated solution that we need to use to produce 50 ml of the different diluted volumes or from the original concentration of 0 0.01 molar. So substituting here, uh, we get 25 ml for 0 0.005 molar. Notice that in the final answer, we are using ml because in the calculations, we also used 50 ml and concentrations in millimoles. Concentrations in millimoles or simply in molar. Mm. It has been expressed in millimoles 
because because the volume the volume unit in the denominator would simply cancel out but but then you can just simply write capital m here and a capital m here and they'll just cancel out anyway so the final unit would really be ml uh, coming from the 50 ml here and then repeating that for all of the other requirements so we have these corresponding volumes from of the 0 0.01 solution from number two so to answer the question 25 ml, 10 ml, and 5 ml of the 0 0.01, 0 1, so uh, molar solution should be diluted to 50 ml to prepare 0 0.005, 0 0.002, and 0 0.001 molar solutions, respectively. Okay, I think that is all for the preparation of standard solutions. Next. For the next set of calculations, this include uh, this is about working with titration data to calculate molar concentrations. So this time we are already doing titration, and we have already reached the endpoint and recorded the final volumes of the standard solutions. Now, how do we relate it to the molar concentrations of the analyte? Number one, a 50 ml portion of a hydrochloric acid solution required 29.71 ml of 0 0.01963 molar barium hydroxide to reach an endpoint with bromopressyl green indicator. Calculate the molar concentration of the hydrochloric acid. The reaction involved is barium chloride plus hydrochloric acid, uh, barium hydroxide, sorry, plus hydrochloric acid forms barium chloride and water. So this is an acid-base reaction or a neutralization process forming a salt and water. To help you visualize the process, um, just imagine a typical titration setup where barium hydroxide is colorless, the titrant uh, the titrant barium hydroxide is colorless. Hydrochloric acid, which is the analyte, is also colorless. Then we have put uh, a chemical indicator, bromopressyl green, to the HCl sample, and its color in acid here is yellow. And then at the end point, its color is green, and if we have added the, the, the standard solution or the titrant in excess, it turns blue. So we're asked to calculate for the molar concentration of the hydrochloric acid sample. So how do we do that? The concentration of HCl is simply moles per liter or millimoles of HCl over ml of HCl. Now for the ml of HCl, it's already given to be 50 ml. Now, how do we get the number of moles of HCl? That will come from the number of moles of barium hydroxide, which we convert into millimoles of HCl. So here's the process. So for, them, for the volume of hydrochloric acid, that's 50 ml. And then to calculate for the millimoles HCl, we start with the volume of barium hydroxide titrant or standard solution, which has been used or which has dispensed on which has been dispensed until the endpoint is reached. Convert it into moles barium hydroxide using its molarity. Then after expressing it in moles barium hydroxide, convert it into 
moles or millimoles HCl. So cancel the units and you will be left with millimoles HCl in the numerator and millimoles HCl in the denominator. So the final answer is 0 0.02333 molar. It's expressed in four significant figures. Now, you may wonder why we used 50 ml, which is the volume of HCl. Um, why, do we, why did we use 50 ml instead of adding 50 with 29.71 ml? So what we are calculating here is the concentration of HCl in the analyte solution, in the original analyte solution before titration. So if we're, uh, therefore, the additional volume after titration does not matter. Okay, or you can also, if you do not like to use this process, you can also think of it this way. In a titration process, the equivalence point happens when the number of moles of analyte is chemically equivalent to the number of moles of the titrant. For an acid-base process, that would be MV of the acid equals MV of the base times the corresponding mole ratio, converting this side base to acid. So using this formula, for example, and we're looking for the molarity of acid, in this case, HCl. So the molarity of the base would be this. The volume of the base would be this. This ratio would be this, converting moles base to moles acid. And then the volume acid, when transferred to the other side, goes to the denominator part of the equation, and that would be this, 50 ml. So again, you can answer the problem using the first process or the second process, and you'll just get the same answer. Whereas, uh, just remember that you do not round off in the middle of, of the solution and report the final answer in four significant figures. Next, number two. Titration of a 0.21 to 1 grams of pure sodium oxalate required this volume of potassium permanganate. What is the molar concentration of the potassium permanganate solution? The chemical reaction is given. So again, to understand better what happens in the problem, we have pure sodium oxalate that's in the Erlenmeyer flask. So that's the analyte solution. It required 43.31 ml of potassium permanganate. So the potassium permanganate is a pink solution and it was used here as the titrant. And we're asked for the molar concentration of potassium permanganate. Now, this time, sodium oxalate is the one which is in the Erlenmeyer flask, but um, it has been prepared from solid form. Therefore, we can assume, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it has been prepared from solid form and uh, it specifically states that the sample is pure. Therefore, this is considered a primary standard. So it's considered a primary standard and we would like to determine the concentration of this secondary standard and probably use this potassium permanganate solution as a standard solution for another chemical analysis for another analyte. So there, and the 
endpoint here happens when there's a pale permanent pink color. So this process, uh, for this process, we have the permanganate solution. This is pink. And then as it reacts with the oxalate ion here, it turns colorless because the, the Mn2 plus ion here is colorless. So it turns colorless until all of the oxalate ions here have been consumed. And when there are no more oxalate ions here, an addition of one or two drops of the permanganate ion would cause a color change to pink. So how, what is the molar concentration of the potassium permanganate solution? So again, um, the molar concentration is simply moles per liter or millimoles per ml. So for the ml of potassium permanganate, sorry, that's, that's supposed to be potassium permanganate. So it's already given 43.31. And then for the millimoles of potassium permanganate in the numerator, we start with the millimoles of sodium oxalate, then just convert it into potassium permanganate. So here it is. After substitution, here's the volume of potassium permanganate, and then here's the mass over molar mass of sodium oxalate to get moles of sodium oxalate, and then convert the moles of sodium oxalate to moles of potassium permanganate using the mole ratio coming from the balance equation here. And then do the arithmetic on your calculators and report the final answer in four significant figures. So we do not need to provide uh, an answer using sentences or a description because we're only asked for the molar concentration of the potassium permanganate solution. Next. Calculating the quantity of an analyte from titration data. Number one, a 0 0.8040 gram sample of an iron ore is dissolved in acid. The iron is then reduced to iron 2 plus and titrated with a 47.22 ml of this concentration of potassium permanganate solution. Calculate the results of the analysis in terms of percent iron Again, this illustration has been provided only to give you an idea of what the colors are like so that you're able to appreciate the problem. Uh, and in doing so, I hope that you'd find more meaning in solving the problem. You do not need to memorize how these look like like the colors, the endpoint, for example, I'm just giving you context while I'm discussing the solutions to this problem. So again, for this analysis, we have the permanganate ion as the titrant. So we've already had an example of the permanganate ion as the titrant where it's pink. In this case, you can see that it's purple, but in chemistry, we usually describe this as pink, and, it, and when it's really just concentrated kind of pink, then it looks purple. So in this case, the Fe2 plus ion in solution, this is supposedly pale green. Okay, so this is a pale green solution. Uh, and upon the addition of the permanganate ion, it turns, the permanganate itself turns colorless because it turns into Mn2+. However, because of the formation of the Fe3+, coming from the Fe2+, so there's an increasing presence of a yellow color. That's why in this case, you can see a yellow, an increasingly yellow shade. And then, when the permanganate ion has completely reacted with all of the iron, so an extra drop 
would not cause the extra permanganate ion to be colorless anymore. So the pink color now mixes with the solution, which is already kind of yellow. So you get kind of a salmon pink or a reddish tinge. So that would be the endpoint in this analysis or in this titration. So going back to the problem. We are asked to determine the percent Fe. So to do that, here's the um, formula for mass of Fe, for, for percent of Fe. So that would be mass of Fe2 plus over the mass of the sample. The mass of the sample is already given. And to get the mass of Fe in the numerator, we'll have to start with the millimoles of potassium permanganate dispensed in the titration process. So that would be this volume times this concentration of the potassium permanganate. Okay, so substituting. So here we have the volume of the potassium permanganate times the concentration of the potassium permanganate converted into moles Fe2 plus using the mole ratio from the balanced equation and then convert it to grams Fe2 plus using molar mass. So again, notice here um, that there's the direct conversion from millimoles to grams. Usually, this would be 558.47 milligrams per millimole. But then, so that we can cancel out the grams, Fe2 plus with the grams sample, so this has been converted into or expressed as grams. On the other hand, personally, again, I would find it more convenient to just start with liters. Because it's for me, it's easier to convert this immediately into liters. So use 0 0.04722 liters. Then this would be in moles per liter. Then this would be in moles Fe, 5 moles Fe over mole KMNO4. And then finally in grams per mole. So this would be expressed in grams Fe over gram sample times 100%. And the final answer is 36.77% in four significant figures. Okay, so this is the mass of the iron 2 plus in the sample. If we would like to express it as Fe304, we do the same process except that in the numerator, instead of converting it into mass Fe2 plus, we will have to convert it into mass Fe304. And we start with the same process here, volume KMNO4. The concentration, molar concentration of KMNO4. And then here we have the mole ratio. Three moles KMNO4 with 5 moles Fe304. So where did that come from? Where did this ratio come from? This ratio actually comes from this balanced equation also that one mole of KMNO4 is equivalent to five moles of Fe2 plus. Okay, so that explains the five here. Also, each mole of Fe2 plus gives a uh, Yeah, um, each mole of Fe3O4 
is equivalent to 3 Fe2 plus. Okay, so if each mole of Fe3O4 gives 3 moles of Fe2 plus, so that would be, that would insert a 3 in the denominator. Okay, again, this ratio um, is not so straightforward, so you cannot really visualize it, but let me break it apart into two different stoichiometric ratios. Okay, so from this, from this unit, we have millimoles KMNO4. So I am going to multiply it with a stoichiometric ratio, which is one millimole KMNO4 in the denominator and five millimoles Fe2 plus in the numerator. Okay, so now I have converted the unit into Fe2 plus. And then I am going to multiply it with another ratio, which is for every three millimoles of Fe2 plus, that is equivalent to one millimole of Fe3O4. Okay, so now that makes the numerator unit millimole Fe3O4, and that has um, included or inserted in the operations a five in the numerator and a three in the denominator. Okay, so that's the same that would have the same effect as this one. But uh, it's just more logical to think about it that way. That Because you know that 1 KMNO4 is equivalent to 5 Fe2+, plus, and then that there are 3 Fe's in 1 Fe3O4. Okay, so there, uh, that's where the ratio comes from. Then, to convert the millimoles Fe3O4 into grams Fe3O4, simply use the molar mass. So then divide by, yes, the mass of the sample times 100%. And report the final answer in four significant figures. So there's our final answer. Next, a 100 ml sample of brackish water was made ammoniacal meaning we simply added ammonia and the sulfide it contained was titrated with 16.47 ml of this concentration of silver nitrate. The analytical concentration is what? Um, calculate the concentration of so, um, hydrogen sulfide or hydrosulfuric acid in the water in ppm. Okay, so we're given the analytical reaction there. So again, to give you a bit of a background, so H2S or sulfide in water has a yellow color and silver sulfide is a, is a black precipitate. So I could not find any yellow solution forming a black precipitate. So can you so you can just imagine it yourselves. We start with this solution, and then as soon as the silver sulfide has been produced, it's going to have a black colored precipitate. So we're asked for the concentration of H2S in PPM. So PPM is defined as the mass of the solute over the mass of the sample times a million. So the mass of the sample again is um, it's not given, but we can easily convert it into we can easily convert the volume into into um, mass if we assume the density of one. That is if it's uh, a very dilute solution. So here, 
the millimoles of silver nitrate is converted into mass of H2S. So, yes. Using this information for silver nitrate, we convert it into mass H2S to get PPM. So, here it is. So, we are able to get the millimoles of silver nitrate using the volume of silver nitrate times the concentration of silver nitrate and then convert it into moles of H2S using the mole ratio from the balanced equation and then use the balance use the mole, molar mass for H2S to get grams H2S. And then, as I have described, for the denominator, we simply convert 100 ml sample into grams sample using an assumed density of 1 gram per ml. So, what gives us the liberty of simply converting the volume of the sample into grams, even though it's not stated in the solution, uh, in the problem. That's because for, for concentrations or for quantities that are expressed in PPM, they're usually very dilute solutions. That is why they're already expressed in PPM because if we express them as percentage, they're going to be really low or very dilute already. So the fact that they're dilute means that their density will not differ significantly from the density of pure water. Because in the first place, they have very few solute. So there's the solution. So after computing, we get 64.8 ppm, reporting in supposedly four significant figures. And yes, the answer should be expressed in four significant figures because the density of water should be considered a constant. And third, I think this is the last, uh, no, the second to the last problem. The phosphorus in a 4.258 gram sample of a plant of, of a plant food was converted to phosphate and precipitated as silver phosphate by adding 50 ml of 0 0.0820 molar silver nitrate. The excess silver nitrate was back titrated with 4.06 ml of potassium thiocyanate expressed the result of this analysis in terms of percent P2O5 or phosphorus pentoxide. So you read the problem again and digest and comprehend what happens in the problem. So We have a sample of plant food. It was converted into phosphate and precipitated as silver phosphate by adding an excess amount of silver nitrate. So this excess amount of silver nitrate was used to convert all of the phosphate into silver phosphate, thus producing this precipitate. And then in this mixture now, we have the silver phosphate precipitate as well as the excess silver nitrate. That excess silver nitrate is the one which will be titrated with potassium thiocyanate. So when we titrate it using potassium thiocyanate, the end point is a blood red color. Okay, so on to the calculations. First, we calculate the concentration of silver nitrate added in total and the concentration of silver nitrate consumed by the thiocyanate titrant. So to, to compute for the total number of silver nitrate, 
that would be the 50 ml times its concentration. So we simply get this, 4.1 millimoles. And then the consumed silver nitrate would come from the volume and concentration of the thiocyanate nitron. So starting from the 4.06 ml volume of thiocyanate, convert it into moles thiocyanate, and convert it into moles silver nitrate. So this is the number of moles of silver nitrate that has been consumed by the nitron, meaning this is the number of moles of silver nitrate that was in excess. So to calculate for the percent phosphorus pentoxide, we would have to get the number of moles of silver nitrate that has been consumed by the phosphorus meaning we'd have to get the difference between the total number of moles of silver nitrate and the total number of moles of silver nitrate in excess. So this would be equal to the number of moles of silver nitrate that has reacted with the phosphate in the sample. Then from the balanced chemical equation, it's not there, but the ratio should be 6 moles of silver nitrate is equivalent to 1 millimole of phosphorus pentoxide. Okay, without the balanced equation, well, you can write it, but without it, you can just look at the ratios from the given. So, you can see that in a silver phosphate precipitate, you have three silver ions for every one mole of phosphorus atom. So in this case, if we have two moles of phosphorus atoms, then that would be equivalent to three times two, or six moles of silver ions in, uh, as silver nitrate. And then converting millimoles to grams phosphorus pentoxide we use the molar mass all over the total mass of the sample the mass of the original sample which is 4.258 grams so we cancel times 100 percent and the final percent of phosphorus pentoxide is 2.14 expressed in three significant figures from this volume and also from this concentration. Final problem, number four. The carbon monoxide in a 20.3 liter sample of gas was converted to CO2 by passing the sample over iodine pentoxide heated to 150 degrees Celsius. This is the balanced chemical equation. The iodine was distilled at this temperature and was collected in an absorber containing 8.25 ml of 0 0.01101 molar sodium thiosulfate, and this is the balanced chemical equation. The excess sodium thiosulfate was back titrated with 2.16 ml of iodine solution. Calculate the concentration of carbon monoxide. So again, to provide context, here's, here would be the colors that you would observe in this titration process, starting with first, the formation of iodine. So this is a concentrated iodine solution. If you're going to titrate it with thiosulfate, the yellow, the intense yellow to brown color of the iodine solution uh, becomes or uh, becomes a faint straw yellow color like this. And then when it has reached this color, you can add starch indicator, which binds with the iodine to form a dark blue to black 
complex. And then continuous titration would convert this into a colorless solution. However, for this problem, it specifically stated that there was an excess sodium thiosulfate. So for this problem, we have the iodine, then it has been titrated, uh, it has yeah, been titrated in excess with sodium thiosulfate, therefore you would expect it to be colorless with starch. And then after it has been provided with an excess of thiosulfate, it is now going to be back titrated with more iodine. So therefore, we will use another titrant, which is an iodine solution, to titrate the, th the excess thiosulfate in this kind of overrun solution. Now, the end point in this problem would be from clear to black. Okay, so I would like to remind everyone that again, I am just discussing this part just to give context, but you do not, this is just for your enhanced understanding but you do not need to memorize this part, this part. Also, is it possible for you to comprehend the problem even without understanding or even without being very familiar with what actually happens in the lab? I think yes. You just have to understand which part is reacting with which which part was provided in excess and which species is now titrating the excess reactant or the, re the excess first titrant. So in this case, again, the analyte is iodine and then the excess titrant is thiosulfate and because the titrant has been provided in excess, we have a second titrant, which is iodine. And of course, you would, uh, in this case, it just so happened that the second titrant is the same as the analyte. So they're the same in the sense that they're the same chemical species, na iodine, but their difference would be that the second titrant solution is already a standard solution. We already know its concentration. In the previous problem, we have a different analyte. We had a different excess titrant, which is the first titrant. And then we also used a different second titrant to titrate the excess first titrant. Okay, in this problem, again, it just so happened that the second titrant that we're using is, is the same chemical species with the first analyte. So, okay, how do we go about this? I have uh, condensed the problem on this slide. So, again, we compute for the total amount of the excess titrant that we used. So that would just be the volume of the excess titrant times the concentration of the excess titrant, so we get its number of millimoles. Next, we compute for the total amount of thiosulfate consumed in the back titration. So to get that, we start with the volume of the second titrant. So this is the second titrant, this is the concentration of the second titrant, convert it into moles of the first titrant using the mole ratio from the balanced chemical equation. So it's this one, one mole I2 um, is equivalent to two moles thiosulfate. So now this is the total amount of first titrant that we used. This is the amount of the 
first titrant that was in excess, if we get their difference, that would be the amount of first titrant that has completely reacted with the analyte. So the PPM carbon monoxide is calculated as here, as I said, the difference would be equivalent to the number of millimoles of sodium thiosulfate that has completely reacted with the analyte, then convert it into moles carbon monoxide using the, the stoichiometric ratio from this balance reaction. Sodium thiosulfate, two sodium thiosulfate is equivalent to one mole of iodine and one mole of iodine is equivalent to five moles of CO. Therefore, five moles of CO is equivalent to two moles of disulfate. And then use this ratio uh, and then convert the moles CO into grams, or in this case, milligrams of CO, which is the molar mass, and all over the volume of the sample of gas. In this case, that's 20.3 liters. And notice the absence of the times 10 to the 6 in this solution. That's because it has already expressed the numerator in milligrams and the denominator in liters. Therefore, milligram per liter is equivalent to ppm. If this has been expressed in grams, for example, let's say the numerator has been expressed in grams, the denominator may also be expressed in grams by assuming a density of one gram per ml. Then you do the necessary, necessary unit conversions to get grams over grams, then you'll have to multiply by 10 to the 6. In this case, however, since you have already conveniently expressed it in milligrams per liter, which we already know to be equivalent to ppm, then that's it. There's no need to multiply by 10 to the 6. So we report the final answer in three significant figures. 0.172 milligrams carbon monoxide per liter of sample. So that ends the ignite part. For the navigate part, because this module is supposed to only fit in 30 minutes of your time, so we are only asked, what are the possible sources of errors when doing titrations? How can these be prevented? So no calculations for the navigate part of this module. Instead, you will have it in lesson 1.14. And for the not part, research in what specific industries are titrometric and graphometric methods used. Discuss the specific applications of these techniques to these industries. So, um, corresponding space for your answers will be provided in the worksheet. So, that ends lesson 1.11. So before I end this video, I'd like to again go over the different kinds of problems that we have discussed. So first, we described titration and you were refreshed with the parts of the titration setup. And also, you probably have um, just encountered the different types of titration because in the previous year levels, you've already, you have only been exposed to acid-base or neutralization titrations. Also, for the calculations, we have answered problems about preparing standard solutions and primary standard solutions. Also, um, we have computed for 
the concentrations of the analyte in a titration problem, specifically for a wide range of titration experiments, not only neutralization, but also redox processes, also precipitation processes, also back titration. So a final tip for solving these problems is for you not to be overwhelmed when you solve the problems. First, read the problem slowly. Read the problem again if you need to. And try to visualize what happens in the process. Try to um, have a clear view of which solution is the analyte, which solution is the titrant in the problem. And also in the case of back titration, always remember or always um, recall which is the analyte, which is the first titrant and the excess, which is the second titrant used to titrate the excess of the first titrant. And when you compute, you will have to know and understand what the numbers mean. So for these kinds of problems, although there are general trends on how we can solve them, but if you have noticed at this time, after several examples, there are really no specific steps to follow. Rather, you just, have, you just need to understand the problem, understand what the units mean for concentrations, and understand what happens in the titration process so that you can just input them in the formula for the definitions mostly of concentrations like molarity or percent by weight or ppm okay so again i hope that this video has helped you digest lesson 1.11 i'll see you in the next video thank you and goodbye class